Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining my presentation, Not a Needle in a Haystack, Increasing Journal Discoverability. Little bit about myself. I've worked in scholarly publishing for most of my career, mainly with journals, and have had roles in library relations, marketing, and journals management. I'm currently publications manager with eScholarship Publishing at the University of the California Digital Library, where I manage 85 journals based across the University of California system. The key goal of open access is the widest dissemination of research, unrestricted by a paywall. Simply making content freely available, however, does not guarantee a broad readership. Ensuring that articles are easily findable should be a necessary component of any, any OA journal's long-term sustainability plan. With readers resorting to a small selection of search tools, what must, steps must a journal take to ensure that it is in the mix for researchers? On a practical level, Building out a discoverability strategy is a significant effort for already understaffed and thinly resourced journals. So what can be done? While this session will ask more questions than it, than it answers, my aim is to surface some of the unique challenges of discoverability for OA journals to offer some steps to help you build out a discoverability strategy and plan for your journal and to discuss whether such activities can or should be scaled. Just so we're all on the same page, I've turned to Wikipedia for a definition of discoverability. Discoverability is the degree to which something, especially a piece of content or information, can be found in the search of a file, database, or other information system. Discoverability is a concern since something cannot be used if people cannot find it or do not understand what it can be used for. As part of my work at eScholarship, I've started to think about how and where our content is discoverable and why this is important. In the subscriptions publishing world, discoverability is important to drive usage, and good usage ensures, ensures that your journal will not be cancelled. We spent a significant amount of time ensuring that journals were included in key databases and were findable via library discovery systems. Absent these types of pressures, discoverability is still important for OA journals and I'll, I'll outline the reasons why in this presentation. I have a large number of unanswered questions myself, and I'll list these two in the hopes that we might spark a useful discussion. Finally, I'll share some ideas around building a discoverability plan for your journals, touching on practical issues that may shape your approach as you create your own strategy. Discoverability happens in a few different ways, and I wanted to outline these here as we think about how to reach readership effectively. Discoverability is for both journals and articles. For example, you might submit your journal for inclusion in the Directory of Open Access Journals or Scopus. On the other hand, an article may be included separately in a subject specific database. Depending on the resource, you may reach a very different readership from an undergraduate looking for a paper in Google Scholar to a researcher looking in Medline to a practitioner working in the field there are many different audiences and databases to target each one. In fact, there are literally thousands of databases from the very general to the highly specialized. And it is worth stressing that for many people, rightly or wrongly, Google search is the primary way that they navigate to content. Location matters too, both geographically and depending on the type of institution where your reader is located, from the biggest research intensive institutions to smaller community colleges. Equitable access extends across many different readership groups and locations, and it helps to think in the broadest terms possible as you think about discoverability for your journals. It's crucial to get a sense of where each journal's content should be situated. A sound discoverability strategy means that your content is not lost in a sea of information. Nobody wants to be on the third page of Google search results. Not only that, Inclusion in some databases are an additional hallmark of quality, and readers know that if you are in this database, your content can be trusted. Most of us are university-based entities, and we may need an assist so that articles can be found outside of the academy where public policy is formulated. Without the large marketing budgets of commercial publishers, inclusion in some databases will do some of the heavy lifting usually done by sales and marketing campaigns. Databases help readers reach information in a timely way. A researcher needs to be able to navigate to the most up-to-date information in order to be able to do their work. 
Finally, your content is visible alongside other journals, some of which may be the leaders in the field, and you get to be part of that conversation. Think about a researcher selecting papers as part of a literature review. You want your articles to be there too, easily findable and part of this important work. There are a few different resources, and I wanted to share a broad outline of the various types of database that are available. Generalist databases. EBSCO and ProQuest probably own the most databases overall, and if you supply them with your information, you'll be accessible in a huge number of resources. They compile academic databases, as well as broad academic da databases, as well as subject-specific ones. Ulrichs is a comprehensive directory of all types of periodicals. Exhaustive resources, such as Google Scholar, aim to cover as broad a range of content as possible. Selective. There are a number of these. Notably for the OA community, we have the Directory of Open Access Journals. Other examples are Scopus and Web of Science. Although both the, these latter ones also provide rankings, and I know that many of us eschew the impact factor, these are prestige databases and many journal editors are eager to have their journal listed. There will be an evaluation process and an elevated set of criteria that your journal will need to meet. Subject specific. These will be dedicated to a particular discipline. Some will be owned by giants, the giants EBSCO and ProQuest, and others, like for example, Psych Info, are owned by the leading society in that field, the American Psychological Association in this instance. Of course, some fall across categories, for example, Medline, which is both medical and highly selective. <coughs> I also wanted to mention library catalog vendors. These companies sell discovery tools to a single library, and that helps the user navigate to content and link through to available resources. In order to assess the university of, of discovery tools, I recommend going to any library website and taking a look at their database subscriptions just to get a sense of what is out there. Even better, if you can chat with a subject librarian. Sometimes you'll find that your content is already included. It's in a database vendor's best interest to find and add new content so they may already know about you. In that situation, I'd recommend getting in touch just to ensure that their information is correct. While the benefits of high discovery are clear, you may be thinking, I don't have the time. I don't understand that technology. And you might want to acknowledge it. And I want to acknowledge that things are never as easy as they seem. I'd like to stress that there are many wonderful things about OA. Most importantly, research isn't paywalled. Anyone reaching your content can read it. It would be incorrect to assume that just because it's open, people know that it is there or that it is reaching the right people at the right time. However, I want to acknowledge there are hurdles that may prevent us from increasing discoverability for our journals. Sometimes understanding what a discovery resource requires from us, the metadata feed, access via an API, requirements around hosting site uptimes and archiving, ensuring your articles have a DOI, can be complicated. Quality controls and high standards are important, but let's recognize that meeting these can be a challenge, especially if you don't have dedicated tech support. Adopting best practices are key. I've listed a few here, and these are the essentials for your publication. They will help databases acquire and use your content, and they will indicate that you are indeed a serious and scholarly publication. Another constraint centers on resourcing. We're often a small staff with little or no funding, and we don't always have the benefit of a development team to handle the technology side of things or time to delve into a readership study to uncover which databases are important. We can find ourselves at a significant disadvantage to larger organizations. A couple of times I've had to compile a title list by hand to send to a database vendor. Submitting applications, verifying data, it can all add up to a chunk of time. More broadly, how to keep up with change? How do we monitor an ever-shifting industry? Companies merge, new databases are launched, some fall from favor, new technology becomes standard, nothing is ever static, and the demands of keeping up with this are significant. The LPC listserv is a great place to ask questions and share knowledge. And the initiative between the LPC and the Association of University Presses to attend each other's meetings will be another fantastic way to foster dialogue.
As a way of moving from the high level to the practical, I want to share some concrete steps that might take that might take you as you think about reaching your might help you as you think about reaching your readership. I've outlined some key thoughts to help frame your discoverability plan. Firstly, it helps to break your strategy from your tactic, tactics. Think first about your goals and then the route to that goal. Your subsequent efforts should be in, port of, in support of the stated strategy, and that will help you target your activities. Examples of goals can be each journal that you have should be in one, at least one key database in the field. And then thinking about the route to that goal, maybe you'll ask each journal editor to recommend a database. Get to know the landscape. Different venues serve different communities. You could dig a little deeper into reader behavior. Poll your editors for those databases that are used most frequently in that journal's field. Figure out what you can do with the time that you have. It may be better to get all your journals into Google Scholar, EBSCO, and ProQuest than spend many hours submitting applications to selective databases that have a high rejection rate. You'll learn a lot about what it takes to get into these databases as part of that process. Don't reinvent the wheel. Take some time to think about who can help you. As I've mentioned, journal editors certainly should know their field, although they may not fully understand how to get the journal into certain databases, they will know which ones that matter. Many publishers list which databases have their journal content on a journal's homepage. Pick a title similar to yours to get a ready-made list of prospects. Over the years, I've had really helpful discussions with subject librarians the knowledge of databases and evaluation and, and evaluation criteria is second to none. If you can't speak to someone directly, I can also recommend LibGuides. Pick one from any library website. I've dug around, dug around in many of these over the years, and I've gained some great insight into a particular discipline. In thinking about the discoverability plan for e-scholarship journals, I've been delving a bit deeper into, into the importance of discoverability for all OA journals and weighing it against these challenges <coughs> as I've outlined them here. And honestly, I don't have the answers, but this is what I'm thinking about and I wanted to share this with you. I've been wondering about the ways that we as a group can share our knowledge, particularly around tech issues. How do we avoid being siloed? What commonalities do we share? What type of service is interchangeable? And as I mentioned previously, the LPC community is a fantastic resource for these type of questions. Should we leverage our collective size and act as a cohort? Can we work together to scale activities and reach results more quickly, have greater impact as a larger group with a common mission? Which entities exist currently and could they be good partners? How do we identify and evaluate these organizations? I know there are a couple of entities that will be speaking around this subject this afternoon, and I'm eager to see if there are opportunities there. How would I assess whether my plan is working? If I'm going to invest time in a discoverability plan, I'd like to know how to measure success so I can adapt and refine as necessary. How to measure impact outside of usage stats. That was a lot. I hope you found it helpful and I've enjoyed sharing my thoughts with you. We'll have some time for questions and discussion and I look forward to your comments.